Why does God need the rapture of the church? Why is there a rapture in God's plan for the end times? Why can't Christians simply stay on earth and wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation? I will answer those questions and more in this video podcast. Greetings, I'm Dr. Paul Felter. Welcome to my video podcast where I expose church fallacies and flawed Christian traditions with Bible truth. I let the Bible speak for itself. If you appreciate the video podcasts, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel or my podcast channel, both named Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Click the notification bell to know when I release a new video. In this video, I will give you five reasons why the rapture is necessary in God's prophetic plan for the ages. Number one, to end the dispensation of grace and return to the law of Moses. Number two, to preach the gospel of the kingdom again in all the world. Number three, to commence the seven-year tribulation for Israel. Number four, to pour out the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb. And number five, for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's look at number one, to end the dispensation of grace and return to the law of Moses. Let's begin by looking at the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 through the lens of the Mosaic law. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Daniel 9.24 I'm not doing a detailed study on the 70 weeks prophecy. That's for another video. But let's notice a few obvious facts. Number one, the prophecy is for 70 weeks of years, not days. That's 490 years. Number two, the prophecy focuses on Daniel's people, the Jews. Number three, the focal city is Daniel City, Jerusalem. So the prophecy is entirely Jewish the Jews, and Jerusalem. Number four, it's not a prophecy concerning the Gentiles or the body of Christ. Number five, the 70 weeks prophecy was given by Daniel under the law of Moses. Number six, the first 69 weeks or 483 years was completed under the law of Moses. That 483-year period started with the command to rebuild Jerusalem in Nehemiah chapter 2. It ended with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. Number 7. Since the first 69 weeks were completed under the law of Moses, so must the 70th week, the seven-year tribulation, be completed under the law of Moses. Number eight, even though there is a gap between the 69th and the 70th weeks, they all must be completed under the law of Moses. The gap between the 69th and 70th week is worthy of inquiry. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Daniel 9.26 Jesus, the Messiah, was cut off upon being crucified on a Roman cross. The dispensation of grace began with the Apostle Paul as we read. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 7. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift 
of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. Paul states clearly that the dispensation of grace began with a new revelation given him by God. This new revelation was not revealed to anyone prior to Paul. The purpose of this new paradigm of grace was that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of salvation through Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace, not the law of Moses. Paul continues, Ephesians 3, verses 8 and 9. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Paul declares that unto me, that is him, the doctrines of the dispensation of grace were given for the purpose of preaching grace to the Gentiles, bringing them into the fellowship of the mystery, which is grace through Jesus Christ, not the law. Also, that the dispensation of grace was hid in God before being revealed to Paul after his Damascus Road experience. Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples of Jesus did not know the mystery of grace. I said all that to make it clear that we are currently under grace, not the law of Moses, and have been under grace for almost 2,000 years. Now back to Daniel's 70-week prophecy. The first 69 weeks of the prophecy, the first 483 years, finished as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. That day Jesus presented himself to Israel as their Messiah. But he was rejected and crucified later that week. But by the following Sunday morning, he had risen from the dead. The tomb was empty. Forty days later, Jesus would ascend back to heaven. But Israel was given one more chance to accept Jesus as Messiah in Acts chapter 7. Stephen testified about Jesus before the government council. They not only rejected his message, but killed a messenger. That was Israel's last chance to receive Jesus as Messiah. After that, God put Israel's kingdom program on hold and inaugurated the dispensation of grace to save Gentiles. But at some future time known only to God, he will return to his people Israel and complete their kingdom program. We know that as the millennial kingdom. The dispensation of grace will be completed at the rapture of the church. The remainder of Daniel's 70-week prophecy will then commence. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that which is determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Daniel 9.27 He, the Antichrist, will confirm the covenant with Israel and many surrounding nations. The words confirm the covenant imply that the covenant already exists, and the Antichrist is strengthening or furthering that covenant. This covenant will last for one week or seven years. As the final week begins, the law of Moses is resumed, as that is part of the covenant the Antichrist confirms. The church has been raptured, so the dispensation of grace is complete. The seven-year tribulation has begun and will be completed under the law of Moses. Notice that in verse 27 above, that the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice to cease. He will stop the daily animal sacrifice in the temple. The rebuilding of the Jewish temple is part of the covenant the Antichrist makes with Israel. The law of Moses can then be observed with a priesthood, a temple, and animal sacrifice. Let's compare the covenant of Moses with the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Under the covenant of Moses, believers are under the law given to Moses. They have a temple in Jerusalem. They have an earthly priesthood. The high priest intercedes for the people. The blood of animals is continually offered as a sacrifice for sin. Now let's look at the new covenant of Jesus Christ. 
Believers are under grace, not the law. Believers are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We do not have priests, but we have a high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, at God's right hand, intercedes for us. And the blood of Jesus was offered once for all sin. So these covenants are mutually exclusive. The blood of animals or the blood of Christ. It cannot be both. Therefore, the rapture must precede the reinstatement of the temple, the priesthood, and animal sacrifices. God deals with mankind one covenant at a time. The covenant of Moses and the new covenant of Jesus Christ cannot be in operation simultaneously. Before the covenant of Moses can be reinstated, the covenant of grace must be brought to a close. The rapture will close the covenant of grace as the body of Christ is caught up to heaven. After the rapture of the church, God will once again turn his complete attention to the Jew and Jerusalem to complete the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. Conclusion for reason number one. God needs the rapture to close the church age, the dispensation of grace, so the final seven years of Daniel's prophecy can commence. Since this final week is for the Jew and Jerusalem, just as the previous 69 weeks were, it must be completed under the law of Moses. After the dispensation of grace closes with the rapture, God once again turns his attention to Israel under the law to fulfill end-time prophecies given under the law. Reason number two, to preach the gospel of the kingdom in all the world. When John the Baptist came on the scene, and shortly thereafter the Lord Jesus, they both preached the same gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 4.23 and again, we see Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Matthew 9.35 Jesus makes a future proclamation about the gospel of the kingdom, stating in Matthew chapter 24 that during the seven-year tribulation, it will be preached again. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Matthew 24, 13 through 14. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom in his earthly ministry from Matthew 4 to Matthew chapter 12. But in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is officially rejected by the rulers of Israel. The miracle working power of the Lord was attributed to Satan. That was a huge milestone in the Jews' unbelief and rejection of Jesus as Messiah. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this man the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Matthew 12, 23 and 24. Immediately, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus begins teaching in parables. The disciples notice the change and ask Jesus why he now speaks in parables. Jesus gave a startling answer. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even what that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Matthew thirteen ten through 13 Because of their rejection of Jesus, they will no longer be able to understand spiritual truth as it is hidden in parables or riddles. 
Only those with the Spirit will understand. No more preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is not mentioned again until Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. The time frame in Matthew 24 is the seven-year tribulation. After the 2,000-year church age, the gospel of the kingdom will once again be preached because the kingdom is finally at hand again. The gospel of the kingdom is based on repentance and continuing to endure the hardships of the tribulation. Notice that there is no mention of grace, mercy, or the indwelling Holy Spirit. To then be saved, one must endure the tribulation without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. During the seven-year tribulation, the Holy Spirit will function as he did in the Old Testament days. He will only indwell certain people for a limited time to complete a specific task. In the church today, we are gifted with the Holy Spirit upon placing our faith and trust in Jesus that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. The gospel of grace is not a performance-based gospel. Therefore, God can bestow the Holy Spirit upon belief. Every true believer in Jesus Christ is filled and sealed by the Holy Spirit. They are baptized into the body of Christ, the church, and receive eternal life at that very moment. Not so with those in the tribulation who must endure unto the end to be saved. During the seven-year tribulation, if you make a profession for Jesus Christ and later take the mark of the beast, your previous profession of Jesus is nullified. You have condemned your soul to the lake of fire by taking the mark. As you can see, these two Gospels are quite different. They are actually incompatible. The conclusion for reason two. In order for the Gospel of the Kingdom to be preached once again during the seven-year tribulation, the Gospel of Grace in Christ must come to closure. The preaching of the Gospel of Grace will come to an end at the rapture, and then the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto the nations, and then the end shall come. Reason number three, to commence the seven-year tribulation for Israel. Now here's another question. Is the seven-year tribulation a period that pertains to or includes the church? Notice that the rapture is always juxtaposition to the tribulation. The pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, all imply the timing of the rapture in relation to the seven-year tribulation. If we can determine the purpose of the tribulation, that will help us determine its relationship to the rapture. So, what is the purpose of the tribulation? Well, to make this determination, we must again look at the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel 9.24 There are six promises listed that must be fulfilled before the end of the 70th and final week, the seven-year tribulation. To finish the transgression, Jews' rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. End of sins, bring an end of sin by destroying the sinners and saving a remnant of Jews. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Jesus himself will redeem the Jews back to God at his coming. Bring an everlasting righteousness. Establish Jesus' millennial kingdom on the earth. Seal up the vision and prophecy to complete end-time prophecies, to anoint the Most Holy, to anoint the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in Jerusalem. We see from verse 24 that the focus of the 70th week, the tribulation, is the Jew and Jerusalem. The six promises of this prophecy were not fulfilled in the first 69 weeks, so they must be completed in the last week, the tribulation. One of the primary purposes of the tribulation is to finally fulfill these six prophetic declarations. Those six prophetic promises were given to the Jews. They are entirely Jewish and will be fulfilled for the Jews and Jerusalem. 
Now, how will the Lord fulfill these promises? He brings the day of the Lord. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Isaiah 13.6 Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty, it shall come. Joel 1.15 The God of the Old Testament is frequently viewed as a God of wrath because he had to resort to wrath and judgment to bring the Jews to a place of repentance. In the tribulation, he will need to do that once again to bring Israel to their knees so that they will call upon the Lord for help. Jesus said as much at the end of Matthew chapter 23, just before giving the Olivet Discourse. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23, 39. God spoke a similar verse through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, the first mention of the tribulation. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. Deuteronomy 4, 30 and 31. As we clearly see, the tribulation period is when God deals with the Jew and Jerusalem once again. During that time, God does not deal specifically with the Gentiles. God has been dealing with the Gentiles for the past 2,000 years through the church, the body of Christ. God must once again use wrath as he did in the past to bring Israel to their knees so they will turn again to him and cry out for help. The tribulation is a time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's name was changed by God to Israel. That period is a time of Israel's trouble, not the church. That must be a reference to the tribulation as Jeremiah states that that day is great so that none is like it. Alas, for that day is great, and that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Conclusion for reason 3. The tribulation is a seven-year period dealing specifically with the Jew and Jerusalem to be completed under the law of Moses. God will use great calamity and the destruction of the day of the Lord to force Israel to repentance just as he did in Old Testament times. It is a time of Israel's trouble. The true church is not invited. To fulfill Daniel 9.24, Israel will finally believe in Jesus and accept him as Messiah and King. We in the true church of Jesus Christ already believe that Jesus is Savior and Lord. The tribulation is about redeeming Israel and judging sinners, those that reject Jesus Christ, the true church is in neither category, as we have already been redeemed. Reason number four, to pour out the wrath of God and the Lamb. Let's look at some passages pertaining to God's wrath. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Isaiah 13, 9 and 13. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastedness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Zephaniah 1, 15. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3.36 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1.18 But there is no wrath coming upon the church, the body of Christ, as the following verses promise. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath 
through him, Romans 5, 9. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 The wrath in the previous verses is when God pours out his wrath upon this earth during the seven-year tribulation. God's wrath does not nor ever will come upon the true believers in Jesus Christ that walk according to his will and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ. Would the Father ever take vengeance upon the redeemed body of Christ? No, of course not. Jesus returns to Israel at the end of the seven-year tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon. He will personally deliver the wrath of God to his enemies. Isaiah gives a startling account. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Isaiah 63 verses 1 and 2. Isaiah asks the Lord why his robe is stained red. The next verse gives the answer. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there were none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain all my garments, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Isaiah 63, 3 and 4. Jesus will personally execute judgment and wrath upon his enemies at his second coming. When, during the tribulation, does the wrath of God begin? Some claim that the wrath of God begins about five years into the seven-year tribulation with the seven bowls of wrath in Revelation chapter 16. But what does the Bible say? Let's look at Revelation chapter 6, the seven seal judgments. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said of the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6, 15-17 As you can read, the wrath of God begins with the seven seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6, not later in the tribulation with the bowls of wrath. What is the purpose of the seven-year tribulation? Number one, God will deal specifically with the Jew and Jerusalem to complete the seven-year tribulation under the law of Moses, reconciling the Jews back to God. The purpose of the wrath is to drive Israel to their knees in repentance and judge a Christ-rejecting world. Immediately after the rapture, there are no believers on earth. Everyone remaining has rejected Jesus Christ one way or another. The true church is already reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this scenario does not apply to the church at all. The church is not in the seven-year tribulation. Number two, to pour out the wrath of God and the Lamb on a Christ-rejecting world to purge out the sinner. This also does not apply to the true church of Jesus Christ. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Isaiah 13, 9. To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude one fifteen. All unrepentant sinners will be removed from the earth at Jesus' second coming, fulfilling the parable of the wheat and tares. The wheat are gathered into the barn, the kingdom, and the tares are cast into the fire, hell's fire. The conclusion for reason four. The true church of God will not be subject to God's wrath, 
we will be raptured prior to the start of the seven-year tribulation. A pre-tribulational rapture is the only paradigm consistent with end times prophecy. The apostate church, the harlot church, the rebellious church will not go in the rapture. They will go through the seven-year tribulation, as they are not part of the body of Christ, but mere Christendom, a mixture of Christianity, paganism, and idolatry. Reason number five, the marriage of the Lamb. What saith the scripture about God having a wife? For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Isaiah 54, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 31 and 32. God divorces Israel because of idolatry. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away, and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Jeremiah 3, verse 8. After judgment, God restores Israel. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken, and grieved in spirit, as a wife of youth, when thou was refused, saith the Lord. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. Isaiah 54, 6-8 The Marriage of the Lamb to His Wife And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Revelation 19, 6 and 7. The Lord is currently gathering Israel, his adulterous wife, back to the land. Once the gathering of Israel is complete, she will go through the seven-year tribulation, enduring the wrath of God against her and a Christ-rejecting world. The rapture of the church will mark the time when God once again returns his attention back to his people, his divorced wife Israel. During the tribulation, Israel will be brought to her knees once again, crying out in repentance for God to save her, just as she did many times in the Old Testament. The marriage takes place here on earth just after the second coming of Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah. I have heard some so called Bible teachers state, that Israel is the wife of Jehovah and the church is the bride of Christ. That is preposterous, as there is only one God and he can't have two wives, thus breaking his own law. But we have been taught that the church is the bride of Christ. However, the term bride of Christ is nowhere found in Scripture. Our Apostle Paul never uses that phrase. Also, the two verses quoted as proofs that we are the bride were written as metaphors or similes, not as declarative statements. John the Baptist tells us the identity of the bride in the following verse. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. John chapter 3, verse 29. The bride spoken of by John is Israel. Jesus is the bridegroom, and John is the friend of the bridegroom who rejoices at hearing Jesus' voice. When John spoke these words, we the church, the body of Christ, did not yet exist. The only explanation for the bride is Israel. The book of Hosea pictures Israel being married, divorced, and remarried to God. The remarriage happens after Jesus Christ saves Israel at his second coming. We, the body of Christ, cannot also be the bride of Christ. The body also being the bride is absurd on face value. 
We need no further explanation. So conclusion. The true church must be removed before the adulterous, divorced wife, Israel, can be restored back to God as his wife. Final thoughts. The seven-year tribulation must be completed under the law of Moses. The gospel of the kingdom is again preached during the tribulation. The tribulation is a time of God's wrath poured upon Israel and the world. The tribulation is for the restoration of the Jew, as noted in Daniel 9.24. The church and Israel are distinct and separate entities, each with a different divine destiny. The focus of Israel's program is an earthly kingdom, the millennial kingdom. The destiny of the church is a heavenly program. The rapture will accomplish the following. The rapture will close the dispensation of grace so God can bring the day of the Lord commencing the seven-year tribulation. The rapture will close the gospel of grace so the gospel of the kingdom can once again be preached. The rapture will remove the church from the earth so God's wrath can begin as defined in Revelation chapter 6. The rapture closes the dispensation of grace after which God returns to dealing with Israel under the law of Moses. The rapture removes the body of Christ from the earth so Jesus can save and remarry the one and only bride, Israel. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. An integral part of understanding your Bible is to see God's timeline from Genesis to Revelation in chart format. I have two such works available in print and PDF. The first is a free, rightly dividing the word of truth chart in landscape format. This chart displays God's timeline from Genesis to Revelation. It alone is a tremendous help in understanding your Bible and can easily be downloaded from my website. Second, a letter-sized booklet named The Master Key to Understanding the Bible. This 64-page guide is full-color and professionally printed. It has 13 large, full-color charts displaying the right division concept in great detail. The guide is a must-have companion for the serious Bible student. The Master Key is also available in audiobook format on Amazon Audible. Both are available on my website, breadoflife.media. If you have enjoyed the video podcast, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and my podcast channel, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Thanks for joining me today. See you next time. God bless.